It's time now for the political analysis of Fromm and Fuller. Al Fromm, former political advisor to the president, Bill Clinton, and Craig Fuller, former political advisor to both presidents, Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. Good morning, all. Uh, Craig, uh, as we kind of have been anticipating for some time, there is now the third indictment of the former president, Donald Trump, uh, in this case, uh, involving uh, conspiracy. And uh, if, if one looks at that 45 page uh, statement, it's pretty compelling. And it, it really throws into uh, discussion the, the fate of America if we can't take this particular trial and test seriously. Give me your thoughts about this as we go into this somewhat precarious moment. Well, I, I want to start <laughs> not with so much politics, but with psychology. Something that I actually studied first before I got into um, government affairs or, or uh, you know, in college. But I, I have thought for a long time, and I actually wrote before 2016 about my concern that that Donald Trump was, let's just say, not like most of the rest of us. And we have in this country, not you know, according to experts, about four percent of the population who are sociopaths. They're not even sure exactly how this condition starts. It might be it might be hereditary. It might be through the childhood trauma. But four percent are sociopaths, and so sociopaths are just different than the other ninety six percent of us. I will. I want to just give you a short list from a a, a mental uh, center that does that does research and treats patients. These are the conditions that identify a sociopath. Constant lying or deception, limited understanding of what's right and wrong, disrespects the feelings and emotions of others, difficulty appreciating the negative aspects of their behavior, violating the rights of others through dishonest actions, arrogance, being callous, difficulty recognizing emotion, having trouble with responsibilities. And I start here because I think we have to begin to really understand that Donald Trump is in this 4%. He is unlike the rest of us. And he has been for a long time. He conducted his business getting loans by misrepresenting you know, his net worth, misrepresenting the value of properties he held. He got elected as a Republican, but he'd been all over the mat when it came to, came to issues. And now, some say for almost the first time, he is being held to account. Because this time, this time as the President of the United States, he literally violated his oath of office, and he did a series of things, any one of which is serious, but in total, in total, clearly demonstrate that he sought to either reverse or block the, the, the decision of voters of this country. And he did it through uh, not just uh, one or two meetings, not just a speech or two. He did it over months in, a, in an organized conspiracy with others to convince states to, to make decisions that would help him. He, in a way, he created his own reality and then lived in it for two or three months, convincing himself that he could somehow block the, the decision of voters. Um, I, I, I really, I read the, I read the 45 page uh, indictment that just came out. I'd read the prior one. Um, in, in total, you know these ch the charges. Any one of them should be disqualifying. But in total, it's just it's just an enormous um, indictment of a person who has some serious serious issues. And in my view, um, one should be held to account. Two should not get close to the White House again. The Republican Party, um, for political reasons, still clings to the notion that going up against him is it going to be a tough and difficult thing and, and could cost an elected official votes, could could damage their ability to raise money. I honestly don't understand it, but I think those two issues are at the source of our problem. I do think if the Republican Party chooses for some reason to nominate Trump, that uh, he will be defeated in the election. The only, the only possibility, and one in which Al and I have talked about and are concerned about, is the no labels group, which could, because in the because these voters in the middle, you know, there are the Trump supporters who are going to support him, as somebody said the other day, even if he had 300 indictments against him there. And there are those who oppose him who would oppose him if if he somehow, uh, you know, the, the case was thrown out. 
It's those voters in the middle. And those voters in the middle, after this repeated uh, description of his conduct, have got to move away from him. So in any in any reasonable election between two major party candidates, I don't see there's a way for Trump to win. And I hope Republicans will come to that conclusion in larger numbers before we get to the convention. Al, uh, I'd love to have your thoughts. Uh, I continue to consider this a, a major issue, a concern for our democracy. But share your perspective. Well, first of all, I'm not a psychoanalyst, uh, but I sure agree with what Craig said. Uh, and uh, I, I agree with everything he said. Uh, I don't want to be cute about it, but the threat to democracy, you know, is not what the Republicans and uh, Trump's lawyers have been saying, which is the indictment. The threat to democracy is what Trump did. Uh, the fact that he's indicted uh, and now will be held accountable for his actions is an indication of the strength of democracy uh, rather than its weakness. In the most simple terms, the essence of our system, our democratic system, is that we have elections, free and fair elections, and uh, uh, the candidates abide by the results of them, even for the presidency. And uh, if you lose, you're out of office. And if you win, uh, you uh, assume office. And the core of that, as George Washington began, the tradition is a peaceful transition of power. That is a very unique thing in this world. Uh, and uh, it's something that we need to treasure. Uh, Trump violated that. Uh, you know, it's not worth going through all the details of the indictment, but it's very clear that Trump uh, basically fraudulently tried to steal the election. He tried to uh, fraudulently affect the Electoral College with fake uh, slates of electors. He, you know, ordered his vice president to violate his constitutional responsibility. And then he uh, fomented uh, his supporters, uh, violently tried to block the procedures in the House that were necessary for the peaceful transition of, of power. What he did is awful. Hopefully, the, over the next several months, he will really be accountable, held accountable in court. But the problem is, to me, even worse, is that this is an ongoing threat to democracy. You know, in December on his silly uh, social media platform, he uh, announced that he's ready to terminate the Constitution to put himself back into power. Uh, he's, he and his cronies have made no secret of their plans for a second term, which would be to basically uh, go after everybody who's their enemies uh, and, uh, and, and to turn our democracy into an autocracy. I, <clears throat> Uh, so this is a, uh, uh, you know, it is a very, very serious threat. I'm stunned. You know, people like Kevin McCarthy, Speaker of the House, third in line to the presidency, would make the kind of incredible statements he made uh, about the Department of Justice and basically uh, propagating Trump's, uh, Trump's lies. Uh, as Craig said, uh, the Republic, most of the Republican candidates, with a couple of exceptions, uh, really the ones who have no chance of winning the nomination at all are the exceptions, uh, have basically stood with Trump uh, against democracy. Uh, you know, uh, and for McCarthy and some of the others, they, you know, they think they need these Republican votes in primaries and Trump votes, and maybe they do. But they're really playing uh, Russian roulette with, you know, short term gain, maybe, but really dangerous, dangerous loss for this party. It's no longer the party of, uh, you know, of Lincoln to Reagan and the Bushes. It's a, it, it, this party is, is way off the, the deep end. Uh, you know, the, the, to me, there's another tragedy that has not been spoken about. And uh, that is the Republicans really brought this on themselves. They could have ended it all. They could have ended it all in, uh, 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 in January of 2021 if they had voted for to convict in the second impeachment. Uh, and 
uh, but they didn't. Uh, and yet, you know, and, and the person who I think has most responsibility for this is Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell could have gotten the votes to impeach or to, or to convict or to, and to make sure that Trump could never run for office again. And then immediately after he voted to acquit, he went to the floor and declared Trump guilty. I mean, how does that square? My, my position is clear. Like Craig, I'm worried about a third party candidacy because the only way Trump can, Trump does have his solid core supporters. If you read Nate Cohn in the New York Times this week, uh, I mean, those voters, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not a matter of, uh, uh, how many indictments, because they don't think he did anything wrong. And uh, so they're going to be with him. And if a third party uh, candidate splits the anti-Trump vote, then it's possible that he could squeak in. But my position is clear. Democracy's on the line. It will be, it will be in jeopardy until Trump is defeated and his movement stopped. As uh, Mike, uh, as Judge Ludig had said, has said, until that happens, democracy hangs on a nice edge. Uh, Greg, I'd like to get your response. I mean, do uh, you feel like McConnell shares a lot of this responsibility? No, I, I do think that Republican leaders at the, the national level have to bear responsibility. I mean, the party looks to them, uh, looks to the, their leadership, and the fact that they just continue to um, duck this is, uh, is, is frankly shameful. I, I do want to say, though, and, and, and Al talks about the, you know, the Republican Party and the issues, the, the consequences. I actually think, first of all, you have to acknowledge that Donald Trump is for Donald Trump. He, he's never helped build the party. He's not really developed many candidates that could win. The, and one of the most interesting stories I've seen this week is how Republican state offices, both parties, national parties, have, have offices in every state in the nation. And they get involved in running statewide campaigns. State, you know, They help the candidates in those states. State Republican Party offices, I believe it was the one in Colorado, is, is can't pay its rent because they can't raise money. Because Republicans who just don't follow the Trump line are holding back their donations at the state level. And, and I think that's something to pay attention to because if those state offices, party offices, can't be successful in getting out the vote and that sort of thing, then candidates ru running in the Republican party will pay a price for what Trump is doing throughout the country. And the money issue is at the national level is also interesting to watch. The numbers about Trump's campaign committee where where you know there was a hundred million and now it's four million because the money's gone to the lawyers to defend him is is just unheard of and and you know the old line follow the money who who wakes up today and says my gosh we need to replenish the coffers for the Trump campaign because he's going to have bigger legal bills and it just it just is hard to imagine that he's going to be able to mount a successful campaign unless he's just going to self-fund it, which he's loath to do, I think. And he's kind of used this campaign. It's now become a legal defense fund. I mean, it's not really a campaign fund. It's it's going to fund his legal costs. And by the way, he's trying to pay the the bills for the for attorneys to support those people who he's asked to be loyal to him, who frankly he's turned into felons and when they lie to the FBI. So it just doesn't it just to me, it seems like, um, you know, if this is an airplane, you've got both engines out and it's and it's slowly going to the ground. But, you know, this guy seems to have one life after another, and there will be people who who continue to support him. I can only hope that people at the in elected office, and we've said this so many times, what they fear the most <laughs> is the inability to get reelected. And if they feel that either their fundraising or their vote counts are going to be diminished by their continued support of Trump, they will leave him in a minute because he's not loyal to them. He's not loyal to the party. Um, I I hope that, as I said, they wake up before we get too far into the 2024 election, although I have to admit I'm not terribly encouraged. Now you have the last word. And not a time for great optimism. 
what Craig says uh, about the state parties is really important in Cali because Trump didn't do anything to help his party. But what he did do is he did put his people in charge of a lot of those state parties so he would have control of the election mechanisms in, their, in, in the states. And uh, there's, they're paying a price. Uh, he probably can get by uh, on the national level for a while anyway, even though I would guess even some of his ardent rich supporters will get a little bit tired of just paying his legal bills and not paying for a campaign. Uh, but who knows, maybe they'll go on forever on that. But uh, the small donors, I would assume, will start to dry up a little bit because, you know, you work hard play by the rules to uh, get a, a, and you want to help your favorite candidate with 25 or $50 because you want him to win the election and he puts it, he basically steals your money. I mean, that's not a formula for long-term uh, success. You know, I agree the elected officials are really critical. Uh, and this is a case where the redistricting really hurts democracy because there are so many safe districts that uh, the only challenge really is in your prime, party primary, at least in the Congress. Uh, and, uh, you know, as long as Trump has a, a dominant position, maybe not a majority, but a dominant position in the Republican Party, uh, I suppose local candidates are going to be nervous about uh, uh, crossing him. The other thing I just want to say, and I apologize for this being a little disjointed, uh, but, uh, you know, when I say this threat is ongoing, these Trump people will stop at nothing to get back into power. And that's scary. There was another story this week about how more than half the money for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. came from a Trump-supported super PAC. I mean, they put in Robert, they're putting RFK Jr. in to damage Joe Biden. No labels won't disclose where it gets its money. I don't know whether there's Trump money or not, but I suspect there's Trump money, a lot of it, in no labels because that's his best path to victory. And so, uh, you know, the shenanigans, we, we, we had a lot of shenanigans as we approached and then went through the 2020 election and in the aftermath. But the shenanigans this time are already started. And I just go back to my point. Democracy is on the line in 2024. And I know there are a lot of people uh, who watch this and a lot of people who disagree with my politics. Uh, and, but what I am calling on is every American who cares about democracy, whether you're a Republican, you're a Democrat, whether you're an independent, you know, to vote for the pro-democracy candidate in this race. Because if you elect the pro-democracy candidate and you don't like him and he's a bad president, you'll change that in four years. But if you elect this Trump gang and they have any way of holding on to power, we may never be able to correct them. Well, needless to say, this will continue for some time. Al Fromm, Craig Fuller, thank you so much indeed. We will see you next week.